cemetery on this beautiful day. <laughs> but it's not a torrential downpour. Um, Dick is going to do this tour again tomorrow and uh, 10 o'clock, same time, right here. So come back if you want and join us. And I'm just going to turn everything over to Dick Howe, our tour guide today. Thank, thank you, Michael. Um, thank you all for coming. This is a, a great turnout, uh, given the weather, but one of my philosophies of life is there's no such thing as bad weather, there's only bad clothing, right? So, yeah. um, and another uh, philosophy, it's sort of the first thing you learn at a tour guide school, especially cemetery tour guide, is to leave with the same number of people you arrive with. So please be careful. We'll be walking on some grassy and sloped areas, and uh, you know we don't want anybody uh, to, to fall or twist their ankle or anything. Um, so what we're going to do for the next 90 minutes is just walk around, and I'm mostly going to tell stories about some of the people who are buried here, and in doing that, I'm going to try to tell kind of bigger stories about um, the history of Lowell and really United States and even some uh, world history. You're going to uh, watch out, this car is still arriving. Don't break my rule, you know, don't break that rule. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the cemetery. Have you ever been to uh, like the old granary burying ground in Boston or some of the, um, the cemeteries, say, in Concord? You know that they're characterized by being sort of tightly packed places, often right next to the local church. Um, and if you look at the symbology on the stones, uh, it's sort of ominous and threatening. It might be the Grim Reaper, or skull, or crossbones, and that reflected kind of societal attitudes toward death, that it was a punishment for your sins during life. Well, in the 1820s, that attitude started changing. It really kind of uh, originated in Concord with the transcendentalists like Emerson and, and those guys. And they saw death was sort of just part of nature. You know, it's like Simba said, the circle of life, right? You know, um, and so they reflected that connection between life, death, and nature in changing the way cemeteries looked. And the first one, uh, the first garden-style cemetery in America was Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, where no longer was everything packed together and very threatening and ominous looking. Instead, it was beautifully landscaped. There were trees, bushes, and it was a great natural setting. Well, Mount Auburn was 1828, and cultural ideas sort of migrated up here to Lowell pretty rapidly. So in 1841, this cemetery was created. Originally, it was 41 acres. They bought the land from a guy named Oliver Whipple for $5,000. They created uh, 500 lots, and they sold the lots for $10 each. Now, back then, each lot could contain 30 burials, and that's how they financed it. Well, the cemetery's grown to 82 acres now, and it's still an active cemetery. Now, this isn't like one of these timeshare tours where you get a free tour and then a pitch to buy a timeshare, but there is space available here. <laughs> Um, and if you're interested in your uh, estate planning needs, either for burial or cremation, just catch up to Michael Wait, Lally here. Is it still ten dollars? Yeah, no, it's a little more than the, the price is slightly more than ten and uh, thirty. Fi families aren't so big as they used to be, so it's not thirty spaces. Okay, with that said, we're gonna um, move along. So just follow uh, follow me down here. So this is the um, this is the Lawrence family. I think I was always drawn to these uh, markers because they're they're sort of distinctive. I, and I, I I'm assuming it's slate, but I'm not an expert on the type of stones. And then I saw Abbott Lawrence, which I know is the the name of one of the founders of the Lawrence Mills, the Lawrence Manufacturing, and one of the founders of Lawrence. But as far as I can tell, uh, these people had nothing to do with that family. Um, instead, uh, the kind of the, the father was, uh, uh, which one was he? I think it was Alvin. Yeah, Alvin Lawrence. Yeah, it says horologist, me me mechanician, inventor, veteran, U.S. Navy engineer, 1864, 1865. All right, so who's the quiz? Somebody here has to know what a horologist is. 
clockmaker. A clockmaker, very good. I had to, I had to go to Chat GPT to figure that one out. <laughs> uh, but he was a clockmaker. Uh, you know, I've often said that Lowell was in the Silicon Valley of 19th century America. If you uh, kind of were energetic and, and industrious and you wanted to get ahead, uh, you came to Lowell. And so there are a lot of what you might call tinkerers today. Um, they became um, mechanicians. I've never heard that before, but they were mechanics. Um, it's like, you know, the, the, the Lowell's motto, it's art is the handmaid of human good. And that's wonderful for artists in the 21st century, but it really had nothing to do with visual arts. Uh, the arts they were talking about were mechanical arts, building things. Um, and so, you know, it evolves over time, but that was the origin of it. And Mr. Lawrence was an example of that. Uh, if he came here, he, he became a mechanic. He served in the Civil War in the United States Navy. Um, he was the engineer on a, a, a side, a, a paddle wheel steamship. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Glory, um, the ship he was on participated in the attack on that um, on the fort that was featured in that. Uh, and then he came back to Lowell and he got into the watchmaking business. And his son, who was Abbott Lawrence, took over for him. And uh, Abbott, uh, but before he retired, was in charge of uh, repairing all of the city's clocks. Uh, for instance, the uh, the clock at City Hall, uh, Page's clock down in Kearney Square and a few others. And then finally, there's their daughter, Genevieve England Lawrence. Uh, she became a teacher. She taught at Lowell High School. Uh, and she, um, she, be she was a science teacher. She went to Wellesley College. She was very active in the Lowell Historical Society and the Lowell Garden Club. Um, and she never got married. And one of the reasons was if you get married, you couldn't work anymore because that's what the law was. Uh, and I don't think we, uh, we kind of quite appreciate that. Uh, I, I remember reading a biography of Tip O'Neill. Before Tip O'Neill went off to Congress, he was the Speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. And I, I don't know what year it was, it was probably in the late 50s. They were on the verge of passing a law that would allow women who got married to continue being teachers. Up until then, if you were a woman and you were a teacher, a public school teacher, and you got married, you had to quit your job. And they were just about to hold the vote, and somebody said, Mr. Speaker, there's a phone call. Uh, it, it's Cardinal Cushing, Richard Cushing, the uh, Archbishop of Boston. And the conversation, as related later by O'Neill, was, Thomas, you can't pass that law. If you do that, they'll all be using birth control, and what will, will happen then? And so they killed the bill. Um, which I think might give you a sense of, like, maybe, you know, the rights of women is sort of, a, a, unfortunately, such a novel, a novel thing. Um, my mother, who's alive and doing very well, who's, I always want to add a year to her age, which is probably a bad thing, but she's 91 years old, Lowell High School class of 1951. And when I saw her last night, I said, do you remember a teacher named Miss Lawrence? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, she was a, she was a science teacher. And sure enough, she was. She taught biology. And I said, what do you remember about her? And she said that she was very old. <laughs> and so that's Genevieve Lawrence. Um, our next stop is uh, right on the other side of this beautiful tree. So you can go on either side right over here. So the guy I want to talk about here is Robert Caverly. Um, he was a lawyer. Uh, in fact, he, he became the city solicitor for a while. He lived over in Centerville. He lived at the corner of uh, Fremont Ave and 3rd Street. Um, but he also uh, was a historian, a poet, and an author. And he was very interested in uh, what he called the uh, Indians, or the Native Americans, uh, in this region. Now, this is in maybe the 1870s, 1880s. It's the years after the Civil War. It's when there's this great expansion um, towards the West. And uh, 
in popular culture, they really emphasize things like the Buffalo Bills Wild West show, uh, and had a sanitized version of what was going on uh, in the West between the United States Army and the uh, and the Native Americans. But people here um, use that to, to uh, revive interest in when this was the frontier. In 1675, this was the frontier of the uh, English settlement of North America. And there was a lot of conflict between the Native Americans and the English settlers. King Philip's War, which was eight, uh, 1675, um, was the deadliest war in the history of the North American content, continent in terms of the number, the percentage of people killed during that war. Uh, and that took place in Chelmsford. Groton was uh, basically wiped out or was evacuated a couple of times. And so Caverly wrote quite a bit about this. And, uh, and you know, it's not what we would consider like factual history today. It, it's more of their view of history from that point in time. But he became fascinated with the story of Hannah Dustin. Now, Hannah Dustin um, lived in what was then called Haverhill, but it was actually what we know as Methuen today. Native American attack on her family's farm. They killed uh, her, uh, some of her family, and she was kidnapped and uh, brought up the Merrimack back to where the Native Americans were going to live up in Canada. Now, on the way uh, up to Merrimack, they stopped in an island just outside of Concord, New Hampshire. And as her captors slept, captives slept, she um, and a 16-year-old boy who also had been captured somewhere else killed all of the, um, their captors. They stole a canoe and they escaped back to here. Uh, and so she, at, at the time, it was like, oh, it's great to have you back. Let's get on with life. But in the 1880s, she became a hero. Haverhill has a statue to her, and Caverly raised money to erect a statue for her on the island up in New Hampshire. Um, and I've, I've gone up there, it's, it's like a New Hampshire memorial, and you, you'll kind of walk out on the island and there's this statue. And it, the, the statue was carved by a guy named William Andrews, who carved monuments here in Lowell Cemetery. That, he wasn't a like art, artist or a sculptor as an occupation. He was a, a headstone carver. But he did a great job. And then if you look at the list of all the people that contributed to the cost of the statue, it's like a who's who in Lowell. So uh, if you ever find yourself going up 93, going through Concord, you want a, a, a break. It's, it's Kentucket, New Hampshire, I think is, is the name of it. Um, and he's the guy that was was responsible for it. Um, next is right over here. So this is called a mausoleum. A mausoleum is a structure built above ground that holds, uh, holds the, the bodies in it. Uh, we'll see several of them on the tour. Uh, the, the main person buried here is Dr. Hiram Parker. Uh, he, you know, most of the people I talk about, uh, the, the, the men or the fathers, were born in New Hampshire or Vermont. And then they came here when Lowell became a place in the 1820s. And that's what Dr. Parker did. He opened a successful medical practice. Uh, but I mostly want to talk about his daughter. Her name was Alice Parker. Now, she was Dr. Parker and his wife's only child. She, was, she wasn't born until he was 55 and his wife was 48. So they were older when they had Alice. And she grew up, she went to Lowell High School. Uh, and she wanted to be a doctor, just like her father. And so she started studying uh, medicine. But before she got too far into her studies, her father died. And he left her a, a pretty sizable estate. And she decided that rather than study medicine, 
she needed to get some legal training to be able to manage the estate. And so she, um, she became a lawyer. Um, she moved to California, and she had a very successful practice in California. Now, her mother, who still lived here, became ill, and so Alice relocated here uh, to Lowell. But she continued her practice, um, and she, was, uh, she became a very successful lawyer. Uh, she married, uh, she actually met another lawyer in um, California. Uh, it was a guy, he, he sounded like a fascinating character. His name was Lesser. He's buried here too. Uh, he was from Montreal, he went to McGill. He studied uh, law in Germany. He spoke Arab, Sanskrit, ancient Greek. Uh, French, German, and Italian, I think. And so besides practicing law, he translated um, all kinds of books into English. But he died at age 42. Um, I think he had a heart problem. It says he was in court, Suffolk Superior Court in Boston in the morning. One story says he walked out and he slipped on the steps and hit his head and it killed him. But the other, I, I think it's more, he was, he had chronic heart problems. and back when uh, they didn't have open heart surgery and, and things like that, uh, that would prove fatal. Um, Alice eventually remarried, um, so is her second husband. Uh, he lived in Brooklyn, New York, so she ended up there. But she's, Alice is really a fascinating character. The, the announcement of the second um, marriage, which is one of the New York newspaper, said, uh, one of the leading suffragettes in New England and one of the best known women lawyers in New England. So I think at a time as we you know, talked about a little while longer uh, that women were really held back from their accomplishments, she's somebody that probably deserves much more attention and recognition than she's got. So that's Alice Parker. Now if you do an about face, don't move, and let me just slide through here. A uh, couple of things I want to mention about this. The, the main person here is named George Harris. Uh, he's another guy that came to Lowell from a farm in northern New England. Um, and he invented uh, what's called the loom harness. Now, if you've ever been to the uh, boot mill, the boot cotton mill museum, the harness is the vertical frame. So it holds every other piece of yarn, and it rotates. It picks them up and then the shuttle shoots the cross yarn through, and that's how the weave gets created. And so he invented one of these frames that worked much better and much faster and made people a lot more money. And so he profited from the invention. He took all that money and he invested it heavily in real estate, um, mostly in what a neighborhood called Little Canada. Now that's, uh, if you think about Upper Merrimack Street, north to the Merrimack River, that was the Little Canada neighborhood. Uh, and, you know, as the name might suggest, it was settled by uh, a lot of immigrants from uh, the French-speaking parts of Canada. One of the buildings he constructed um, was said to be the largest residential apartment building in Massachusetts, and it was called the Harris, named after him. Uh, it had a couple of stores on the first floor and it had 48 apartments and there were about 300 people living within it. And it probably had two bathrooms for the 300 people. Um, you know, the, if, if some of you might know a, a guy named uh, Armin LeMay who was the mayor of Lowell and he's sort of like a, a leader in the, the Franco community. He always told this story about when he was a young man and getting involved in politics, somebody said, hey, hey LeMay, uh, we just got the voting results from this neighborhood in Little Canada, and there's this triple deck here, and there's 30 voters voted from this one building. Can you explain what that's about? And he said, well, the third floor is vacant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the 1960s, Lowell had an opportunity to urban renewal and to revive the neighborhood. And I, I mean, it, it's a, a debate for another day, but what happened was they just demolished the entire Little Canada neighborhood. Um, but now that's the UMass Lowell East Campus, and hopefully that's going to be revived. The other thing I want to mention about this um, monument is if you knock on it, it's hollow. And that's because it's not made out of stone, it's made out of zinc. 
and there's about half a dozen zinc monuments in this cemetery. Um, in the late 1800s, it was known as the poor man's marble. Um, that it had the, it could have the definition of a well-crafted marble monument, um, the longevity that would come with this metal. Um, and I have to say that they really retain, retain their look. Um, but I guess they went out of out of favor. I don't know. Maybe zinc got too expensive. But um, that's one of the zinc monuments here in the cemetery. Okay, we're going to retrace our steps this way. So this is Charles Reynolds. Um, he came to Lowell as a teenager. He, you know, there was an apprentice system where you would come here and you'd be kind of signed on with somebody that had a skill and you would learn the school. It was sort of like a di dispersed vocational educational school uh, system. And he got hooked up with a stone cutter. He was going to use the learn the stone cutting trade. Well, he did, but I, I think he had a. Uh, active imagination and he became bored by cutting stones so he went down to new bedford and he signed on with a whaling ship that was going to the south pacific um, and on that journey the ship was wrecked and he came ashore on fiji uh, eventually was rescued brought to australia and he spent a year in australia waiting to find a way back to his home he signed on with another ship that went around the world uh, in the other direction to Manila and then India, around Africa, and then back. So he came back to Lowell. Uh, he arrived back here in 1845, went back to stone cutting. He only lasted four years at that. And 1849, where do you think he might have went? Lowell. No, he was here. Uh, yeah, he went to San Francisco to, you know, see Brack Purdy in the 49ers uh, <laughs> try to find gold. Uh, he didn't. He came back and he kind of buckled down to the, uh, to the business. He had two sons. They went into the business and they became very uh, successful in stone carving. And this is when, you know, you're building buildings like City Hall that are all made out of granite. People were cutting the blocks of granite. Um, and coincidentally, Reynolds got into politics uh, he probably had great stories to tell when he was at Bean Suppers, you know, about being shipwrecked. Uh, but he became a, an alderman, then he became mayor. And then after his term as mayor, he was um, put part of the commission that um, built the, the current Lowell City Hall and the Lowell Public Library, which both opened in 1898. Uh, and so, you know, there's, you'll see anchors on some monuments and in cemetery Lore, there's some talk that that was an early Christian symbol for a cross. When Christians were persecuted, you could have an anchor hanging, and, and uh, somebody would say, you can't have a cross here, and they'd say, no, it's not a cross, it's an anchor. Um, but in his case, there's actually some connection with uh, you know, being a seafarer, so uh, an anchor seems a perfectly appropriate symbol on his stone. All right. Uh, we're just going to take a left right up here. So this is another mausoleum. It's the Sargent family. They were based mostly in Westford, Massachusetts. And you can, uh, you know, when I get down or you can see, if you look, through the middle, uh, there's a beautiful uh, stained glass window in the back of it. Um, I will say that in September, we're planning to do a mausoleum tour. Um, 
My predecessor in doing these tours, Catherine Goodwin, used to do them, but she limited it to, to 15 people because, you know, with like if it wasn't raining today, we'd probably have 100 people here, um, and you can't have 100 people going into the small space. Um, but instead, what we've been doing the last time was it was a self-guided tour where we give you a map and we have a guide at each one of the mausoleums and you work around. Uh, you walk around. Now, it worked out pretty well, although it really made me realize how poor the map reading skills of the average American were. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll, I'm working on a GPS solution to that, so don't worry about it. Um, the guy buried here is named Alan Sargent. His father's name was Charles Sargent. Uh, he was another mechanical inventor. He, he, he he invented machinery that improved uh, the, the creation of woolen cloth. Uh, they called him the Thomas Edison of the woolen industry. Uh, so he became very successful. Uh, and because the prime mill spots in Lowell were all bought up already by the big mills, they went to Westford and they established a, they, they took an old grist mill and they converted it to a woolen mill out there. Uh, the family became very successful. Uh, and this is probably kind of the biggest, you know, uh, most powerful, I guess, uh, mausoleum in the cemetery. And it's from 1924. That's sort of the golden age of mausoleums was maybe 1890 to 1920. So this, this was sort of at the end of it. Okay, next stop is over here. So uh, this is the one I want to talk about, and the person I want to talk about is named William Clark. Uh, he was born here, um, 1840, roughly, uh, 1843, and and his father's name was Tilton Clark. He's the one that came to Lowell, but he came to work on the railroad. Um, when, I mean, the last time I did a tour over in that corner, there was a, a, a locomotive sitting on the on the bridge idling um, and nobody could hear me so uh, it was a reminder that railroads are a big part of Lowell um, and I think that's one of these things that's underappreciated but that's how his father came here well anyway Civil War starts William Clark 19 20 years old he enlists in the United States Army goes south uh, but like many others who served he got he contracted an illness um, it didn't kill him, but it disabled him from further service in the military. However, he stayed in Washington and became a clerk in the War Department. Um, because he wasn't in the Army, he didn't have a barracks to live in, so he rented a room on 10th Street in Washington. Um, his landlord's name was William Peterson. And uh, it was April 1865. Uh, the war had just ended, everybody's celebrating. It's a Friday night, and like any 23 or 24 year old on a Friday night, he goes out. Um, and when he comes back, there's this huge crowd blocking the entrance to his, uh, his rooming house. Well, the rooming house was across the street from Ford's Theater. And that was the night that Abraham Lincoln was shot. And when Lincoln was shot in his, uh, in his box up in Ford's Theater, they carried him, still alive but unconscious, out of the theater across the street into the Peterson boarding house. And they put him in the first bed they could find, which was William Clark's bed. And there Lincoln lay for a few more hours until he died took the body, they brought it back to the White House. Clark was able to get back in his room. And they wrote a series of letters to his sister who was here in Lowell, and the letters survived. And he talks about sleeping in the bed that has the president's blood stain on the pillow and on the, on the, the bedding, um, that tomorrow he's gonna walk to the White House to return the president's boots to them. Um, and then after a couple of weeks, he writes, I'm coming back to Lowell, I can't stand it here. People keep, keep breaking into my room and stealing stuff as souvenirs. <laughs> so he did come back to Lowell, 
Um, he never did marry, didn't have a family. He uh, worked as a, a retail clerk, um, and then he died at about age 44. But I often say that you can pick any event in world history, at least since 1826, and you can find some connection back here to Lowell, and I think that's a pretty good example of it. I guess there's a, I haven't seen it yet, I attend to, there's a new series on Apple TV called Manhunt, which is, it's, uh, it's about uh, John Wilkes Booth and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So if it's uh, something you're interested, I don't know how they depict uh, William Clark's room in it, um, but, uh, but if you do watch it, think of William Clark. Uh, we're just going to walk up here a little bit. Um, scripture. I always heard of scripture's cleaners. Does anybody... Okay, but how about Scripture's Bakery? So that was, so this fam, this is the family of Scripture's Bakery, which was on Back Central Street. Um, it was, uh, if you're like standing in the back of what I would call Zayers, or you know that Central Plaza, and you look up Central Street, Scripture's is on the right. For the longest time, it was the Italian American Club. Lowell only had a very small population of Italian immigrants, but they had a club and it, it, it continued for quite a while. Um, but the scriptures were one of the first residents of that neighborhood. And they start, actually it was somebody else than the Isaac scripture married into the family and they took over the bakery. But I think that back central neighborhood is one that maybe doesn't get enough attention um, in Lowell. Like, you know, I live in the Highlands and the Acres certainly gets a lot of I attention from historians, but Back Central was one of the original neighborhoods in Lowell because the Concord River, which is right behind me, um, was sort of a main source of energy and power. And there was a lot of mills there before the great mills arrived in the 1820s. So this neighborhood was built out early and because it was so close to downtown and the big mills, it became very densely populated. So there's a lot of history in that neighborhood that I think deserves to be um, excavated. Now, the other the next person I want to talk about here, his name is Thomas Bailey Lawson. And he's an artist, a, an actual artist, as opposed to a mechanical artist. Uh, and he's perhaps one of the most famous artists in Lowell. And he's buried over there somewhere, but he doesn't have a marker. And Michael Lally is <laughs> showing you the approximate spot. And Michael, could you come back and tell us a little bit about why Thomas Bailey Lawson is significant? Well, Thomas Bailey Lawson was the founder of the Lowell Art Association. And the Lowell Art Association today owns and operates the Whistler House Museum of Art down on Worthen Street. Um, they have a beautiful portrait of him there, and uh, he was really very, um, very instrumental in bringing arts to Lowell. So Thomas Bailey Lawson, it would be nice if he could have a monument <laughs> uh, just for his contributions to the art community. But visit the Whistler House anytime, you'll see his portrait there. And we're doing a portrait tour uh, sometime coming up in the fall where we will have people's portraits at their gravesite, so you might be able to see them in that one too. <laughs> All right, thanks, Michael. Uh, up this way. <laughs> so, uh, Hokum Hosford, born in 1825, when he was maybe. 14 or 15 years old, he came here to Lowell, and he began working, really, it's like a retail clerk. Uh, they were called dry goods stores, um, but he made an arrangement where, with, with the owner of the store that he could actually live in the store and eat from the material that was being sold. 
So he's very frugal and he saved up money. Uh, he saved up so much money that he was able to buy the store. Uh, he, it was, you know, Hosford store or something like that. Uh, he hired a young man uh, to work for him who eventually became his partner. And the young man's name was Arthur G. Pollard. And um, Arthur Pollard eventually bought out Hoss, uh, Holcomb Hosford and changed the name of the store to Pollard's store, which I'm old enough to remember. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of you are, but uh, it was on, it, I, I remember being on Middle Street, um, but I think it had an entrance on Merrimack Street too. I mean, it was big. Uh, it it, it was uh, kind of had entrances on both streets. Um, Hossard went on to become the mayor of Lowell. He served as the mayor during the Civil War. Now, I've done a lot of Civil War military history, and during the war there were 500 men from Lowell who died while serving in the military. And inevitably, Hossford's name would come up as giving a eulogy at one of, one of their funerals. He lived uh, on back Central Street. You might have heard of Hosford Square. Um, it's uh, where Elm Street comes into Central Street. And what's the street that goes down the, the hill to the Whipple? Watson. Watson, Watson Street. So right there, and, and there was a house at the top that, that was, has been fixed up over time, and that was, that was his home. Uh, he also became an, uh, like a, a director of uh, the Lowell and Nashua Railroad. And while he was there, he's credited be, to be the, fir the person who invent the uh, automatic signal, um, or the automatic switching device, where the, somebody up in the tower in the railroad yard could control the switches of the tracks that caused the trains to go in the right direction. So he's supposedly the first one to have done that. So that's Hokum Hosford. Uh, so we're going to just go on the other side of the rhododendron bush, and we're going to talk about the chapel. Is that his first name? Hokum? Hokum. Yeah. We're going to cut. We'll be going this way, so you can come on down here. So I'll just read this, uh, the plaque. Uh, it, this is called the Talbot Chapel. It's in honor or memory of Charles Potts Talbot. Uh, born in Ireland, 1807, died in Lowell, 1884. This chapel is erected in loving remembrance by his wife, Harriet E. Rogers, in the year 1886. Uh, the cemetery had uh, what was called a chapel, but it was like a small wooden octagonal structure. Uh, this one is much more substance, uh, substantial. Uh, the cemeteries actually started using it uh, more for, uh, for programs, like uh, the, in partnership with the Lowell Historic Society. So they've, they've done a couple of programs in here. Uh, it's done for memorial services. I think it holds about 82 people is the capacity. And it was designed by Frederick Stickney who was a Lowell architect who designed, among other things, the um, what's now the Pollard Memorial Library. Uh, and so it, it, you could probably see some similarities in, in the style of it. Um, Talbot, uh, he, as the thing says, he came to Lowell as a young man. He didn't come to Lowell. He came to America with his father and mother. Uh, the father was in the textile business. Um, they, uh, he died uh, almost right after he got here. The mother uh, brought Charles and his brother to Northampton, Massachusetts, where they kind of learned the textile business. They came here. Um, the, the, the older brother named Thomas came first, and he created a dye company, meaning uh, uh, to color cloth. Uh, and it's not so much an issue anymore, but when I was old enough to start washing clothes on myself, on my own, and you know, I put a red shirt in with a white shirt, and came out with two pink shirts, um, I realized that you know, dye and cloth is a pretty important thing. Uh, and so it was a really big deal in Lowell because of all the cloth being created here. 
So that company was pretty successful. Uh, but the Talbot brothers were like, hey, we should get into this cloth manufacturing business ourselves. But like Sargent, um, who couldn't find any space in Lowell and went to Westford, they went to Belrica. And so the Talbot Mills on the Concord River in Belrica is, um, was their primary business. Okay, uh, we're gonna go right over here. Thank you. Um, Meigs, M-E-I-G-S, has is, is always been pretty prominent in American history. Um, there, there was a guy named Montgomery Meigs who was the quartermaster general in, uh, during the Civil War. Uh, when I was in the Army in the 1980s in Germany, there was a, a major named Montgomery Meigs who went on to become a four-star general and commanded all of NATO, so I, I assume he was from the same family. But returned Jonathan Meigs was a, a doctor. Uh, he was an eye doctor here in Lowell, and he had a brother named Joe Meigs who uh, also was a doctor. Now, it was their father who brought them all here. His name was Joe Vincent Meigs. And he's a very interesting character. He's born in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, he stayed on the Union side during the Civil War. And after the war, he moved to Washington. He was an inventor. And he went to work at the US Court of Claims, which is the court that then enforced patents. And it was there that he, um, ran into a lawyer named Benjamin Butler, who was a handled patent lawsuits among a lot of other lawsuits. And you know, most of you know Ben Butler from Lowell. Um, he was a general in the Civil War. After the war, he resumed practicing law. Uh, and he kind of swept Joe Meigs off his feet and convinced him to come here to Lowell. So Meigs came, uh, he bought a house on Andover Street right next to Butler's. Uh, and raised his family here. His two sons became prominent doctors. Well, while he was here, uh, Joe Meigs, uh, he, he invented what was called the single track railway. It was essentially uh, a monorail, like you might see like at Epcot, uh, at, the, at, at Disney World. Uh, and he proposed building one in Cambridge. as sort of like, uh, so this is when subways are first emerging. And so Meigs came up with this like system of trestles with a single rail and the car would be up on top and stop at the elevated station. Uh, and he, he spent a lot of time before the legislature making that pitch, but they went another way. Um, but this is the Meigs family. They had ancestors who were on the U.S. Supreme Court, were go the governor of Ohio, uh, right within this same family. Now these monument are these these graves here kind of show how it was originally with the granite curbing around it that gives you a sense of what the lot that had 30 burials would look like in fact almost all of these lots had those curbs around them uh, but when uh, it and it used to be that the people who owned the lot were responsible for caring for it but that usually meant having your gardener come here one day a week rather than work in your own yard. Um, but as people didn't have gardeners anymore and so they started moving around, um, they started uh, leaving it to the cemetery to take care of them. And there was a cost associated with that. So when you um, bought a lot, if you wanted the cemetery to care for it, you would pay a lump sum for perpetual care of the stone. So as we walk around, occasionally you'll see a stone that says perpetual care on the bottom of it. And I think those are from this cutover period where some were being cared for by the cemetery and some were still privately cared for. Uh, but with the reality of like ride on lawnmowers, they weren't really you know, conducive to this kind of granite curbing. So the cemetery pulled most of it up. Uh, we still have most of it stored um, nearby, but we, they left a few just to um, give you a sense of what it looked like. Next is right over here, Jonathan Tyler. Uh, you might be familiar with Tyler Park, which was actually donated to the city by his wife and daughter. Um, he was, his father was like one of the original big landowners 
before Lowell was Lowell. Uh, there were three guys that had enormous farms that um, composed what became downtown Lowell. There was Moses Cheever. He was up in a like, little Canada neighborhood. There used to be a Cheever Street. There was Josiah Fletcher, who had uh, kind of Merrimack Street to the river. And then there was Jonathan Tyler. So Jonathan Tyler had Merrimack Street to the Pawtucket Canal. So if you think about the Pawtucket Canal that comes down like where the Union Conference Center is up to the, um, the Judicial Center, everything from there over to Merrimack Street was owned by him. He, his house was where the federal building was that's now Middlesex Community College. And it was a very big, substantial house. So when the, the mill guys showed up, they bought all this land from Cheever, Tyler, and Fletcher, and others. Um, Tyler bought land in Middlesex Village up near Hadley Field, and that's how the family ended up up there. However, the house he had built on East Merrimack Street the, the mill owners converted to a hotel, and he became the one that ran it. Now, when the first mill opened in 1823, the Merrimack Manufacturing Company, which is about where the Songus Arena is, the only buildings from there to his house at the federal building was St. Anne's Church, and uh, there was Kirk Boots House, which is, was about where uh, Boarding House Park is. There was not, nothing else. So like, if you're on Merrimack Street, there's the river right over there. There's no like line of buildings. So it's just a big open space. Uh, and so that's, that's Jonathan Tyler. Uh, we're gonna do a U-turn around this big tree. So we're going to talk about this mausoleum right here, George Field Lawton. Um, he, uh, he became a teacher, and he rose up through the ranks. He became a teacher, a principal. He actually became the school superintendent. And in the process, he became a lawyer. Um, he eventually was uh, appointed to be uh, a judge of the Superior Court. Um, and so uh, he... Uh, he served there until his retirement at almost age 80. Uh, he married his, he had met his wife when he was a teacher. She was also a teacher. She taught at the Green School, which is the one right next to the Smith Baker Center across from City Hall. Uh, they had a son and a daughter. Um, the son was a school principal somewhere else and he sort of like disappeared. And that's one of these mysteries that there was no explanation of what happened to him. I think he, he died somehow, uh, but I haven't kind of cracked the mystery of, of what became of him. Um, the daughter survived. Uh, there's a sort of a sad story. George died um, by drowning. Um, he was visiting the daughter on Cape Cod, and he went swimming in a pond, and while she sat on the on the shore watching him swim he got into trouble and he drowned and she didn't know how to swim so she wasn't able to help him um, so he he drowned um, she became uh, her name was Helen she sort of reemerged in 1955 and it sort of the, it, and it was after she died let me just find it because I want to get it right this is a big headline in the Lowell Sun, uh, February 15th, 1955. And the headline is, Get Money If They Remain Unmarried. Dateline Cambridge. The Mrs. Bernice D. Moore and James E. McKern in today uh, were assured of financial independence if they remain unmarried. Under the terms of the will of their aunt, Miss Helen L. Lott, they were left the bulk of her $120,000 estate if they remained single. Um, so the most shocking thing to me was that that was 1955, which was only like three years before I was born. Um, but 
and it seems awful like both weird and cruel uh, in in a way but then I started wondering about that whole thing you know the era she came from if a woman had her own money and she got married it wasn't her money anymore it was the husband's money um, and, and and there's that whole thing about having to leave work if you get married um, and so in some respect I, I wonder if she was trying to like really provide financial independence for them that they, they if they didn't want to get married they didn't have to get married of course you know letting them keep the money anyway would probably be a better approach to it <laughs> Uh, but that's just another kind of a, a uh, kind of a weird thing. But it got a lot of attention, um, and so that's the Lawton family. Next is down here. So this is the, the Pilling family. Um, F is Fred. Uh, Fred's father came to the United States at age 19 from England. Uh, he became began working in the textile uh, business. He ended up in Haverhill, Massachusetts. From there he went to Salem. And when he was in Salem, he learned the shoemaking business. Uh, and he came back to uh, Haverhill and he built a, a, a company that made shoes and it grew quite big. It was called the John Pilling Shoe Company. But uh, by 1890, um, there was a lot of labor unrest in Haverhill. You know, we know that the Bread and Roses strike was centered in Lawrence a couple of decades after that. Um, and so what I've read is that a number of shoe, big shoe companies from Haverhill relocated to Lowell because they expected less trouble from organized labor. Now, I know there was organized labor here, but I always had a sense that, um, you know, because of the ethnic competition, um, that, that the, the workers were never really able to unify together uh, because... You know, the Irish felt that the French had displaced them, and the French felt that the Greeks had displaced them, and they felt that the Portuguese had displaced them, and one after another. But whatever the case, um, John Pilling moved his uh, shoe factory here. Uh, it, it's in the acre, uh, right next to the uh, Francis Gatehouse. If, uh, again, I'll, I'll throw these, like, you know, if, if you're above the age of 60, you'll get my references. If you're not, you'll ask you know, somebody older than you. Uh, but Burbeck's ice cream stand? Yeah. Yeah. If you parked at Burbeck's and walked along the Pawtucket Canal, you get to the John Pilling Shoe Company. It's now uh, part of the Lowell Housing Authority. It converted to elderly housing. And it became a really big, uh, big business. It was owned by Fred till he died. Then his son, John W. Pilling, ran it. Um, what happened was in the 1920s really was the last gasp of the of the main textile industry in Lowell. That's when, I mean, it, it sort of started losing steam after the Civil War, uh, and then the momentum just sort of bled away. But 1920, you know, there's a saying that the Great Depression came early and stayed late in Lowell. The Depression, you know, globally started in 1929. By 1920, it had already kind of hit Lowell. But into this gap created by the, the demise of the textile mills came a lot of shoe companies. And so a lot of people uh, in Lowell worked for shoe manufacturers, and uh, Pilling was one of them. Okay. This is Henry Howe, I can't resist, uh, even though it's no, no relation to me. Uh, you know, you have the Howe building in Lowell, you have Elias Howe created the sewing machine, but my relatives just, you know, they came from Ireland in 1890, so 
These guys were already established then. Um, Henry uh, was a carpenter, uh, as was his brother John. Um, and they're pretty good examples. They're, they're almost emblematic of the Lowell story in the 19th century. They came here, they were carpenters. Lowell was a boom town. Uh, there was this incessant need for new houses, new buildings, things like that. And so workers like these guys fulfilled that need. Um, but they weren't satisfied with being carpenters. They became builders. In fact, they became experts in mill construction and constructing really big buildings. Um, so they built mills all over uh, New England. They built some of the largest hotels in Boston. Uh, they both they lived on Summer Street overlooking the South Common uh, in really nice house that was joined together by a party wall so they each owned it was almost like an early condominium. They also ran a lumber company. The lumber business was really big in Lowell, and to understand like how the city got here helps understand that. When the English first came, the main industry was extracting timber from the, uh, the woods in northern New Hampshire. And the way they get that to the seacoast to be made into ships was to float it down the Merrimack River. And they'd bundle these logs into big rafts, sail them down the river. And that worked great until you got here, and then they hit the Pawtucket Falls. And then your bundle of logs would become a bunch of toothpicks on the other side of the falls. So what they had to do was actually pull all these logs up on the, the land, drag them with oxes and horses beyond the falls, put them back in the river to continue. That's why they built the Pawtucket Canal. The Pawtucket Canal leaves across the street from Burbex above the falls, and it enters the Concord River behind the Union Conference Center. And so it used four lock chambers to deal with the 32-foot elevation change in the drop of the Merrimack River at Pawtucket Falls. It was a great success, um, and it was mostly to get logs around the falls. So it sort of stands to reason that they would pull some of the logs out and use them here. And so a bunch of sawmills and lumber yards um, sprung up all along the Pawtucket Canal, particularly in the Acre, like down around Western Ave. Um, you know where Clemente Park is now? That was a big sawmill and a lumber yard, and that's where the, the Howe brothers had their lumber yard. Uh, he became a director of a local bank. Uh, he invested in the community. He was very charitable. And that's sort of a, 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 a really theme of this place, is that you know, the, the, the big shots that had all the money that came here and built the mills, they stayed in Boston. They just sent their money and their managers up here. And so they really didn't do much for the community. But people who came here with nothing and were given an opportunity and became very successful, not only stayed here, but they really invested in the community. So, you know, here's a guy who starts out as a teenager, as a carpenter, uh, and he becomes a really prominent person in the community he stayed here um, and, and he helped make the community a better place and that's that's a recurring theme throughout this place and I think that sort of helps you understand how Lowell you know functioned through the it's almost two centuries next year okay next is uh, over here in the left So this is Thomas Talbot. He's the brother of Charles, the guy that the chapel was named after. Um, he, he ran the mill in Belrica, uh, but he got involved in politics. He became a state rep, a state senator, then he became lieutenant governor. And while he was serving as lieutenant governor, the governor died, which made him governor. Um, he uh, served out that term. He ran for re-election as governor. He lost. Uh, but then two years later, he ran for governor again. He was a Republican. And the Democratic opponent was also from Lowell. His name was Ben Butler. And so they had this face-off. And a really big issue was who was going to be better for the workers. And Butler, as a lawyer and as a politician, um, had been a, a real proponent of the shorter workday, better wages, better conditions and so he was the champion of the worker but through the campaign it turned out 
that the people who worked in the Talbot mills had much better benefits and much better working conditions than the people who worked in the Middlesex company, which was the mill primarily owned by Butler in Lowell. So it was almost like Butler's rhetoric didn't match his actual, you know, how he acted. And Talbot ended up winning. And so uh, he was elected governor in his own right. He is one of two uh, people from Lowell who have served as governor. Both of them are buried here. There's Thomas Talbot, and the other one is Frederick Greenout. He's the person that the Greenout School was named after. Uh, he's in the other part of the cemetery. All right, we're going to go cross country now, so uh, just watch the wet grass. So this is a, a family lot right here. This is uh, Crosby. Um, main person buried there, his name was Nathan Crosby. He was the uh, justice of the police court in Lowell, which is sort of like the Lowell District Court of that day. The police court was, um, you know where Brood Awakening is on Market Street? Right across from that. Um, it, it, I don't know what's in there now. I think it's a credit union. Uh, when I was a kid, that was the little police station before the uh, JFK Civic Center. The police station was there. It had been known as the market building, um, but the, the police court or the district court had been uh, in there up till 1924 when it moved to Heard Street. So Nathan Crosby was the judge. He had a daughter named um, Rebecca. Rebecca married a lawyer named Zachariah Caverly, um, who was a cousin of Robert Caverly, the guy who promoted Hannah Dustin. Um, Zachariah and Rebecca get married. She becomes Rebecca Caverly. Uh, in, during the Civil War, Zachariah, he didn't serve in the military, but for some reason he had business in South Carolina. Um, the, the Northern Army, uh, was on the seacoast. They, they were in the land after they recaptured Fort Sumter. So he went there. He caught a disease. He died. Um, he left Rebecca a widow, two young children, a daughter named Amy, who uh, was only a couple years old, and then a son. Well, fast forward to 1877. Amy is turning 16. And so Rebecca decides that as a, like a sweet 16 gift, She's going to take her to Europe um, for a tour. Uh, they, they go with some other people, uh, and they, they book passage on a German steamship called the SS Schiller. Uh, it's cruising along. It's approaching the southwest coast of England, and it's a foggy night. The crew loses its awareness of where they are, and they run aground. There's a big storm that blows up. Uh, and uh, the, the, all the women and children are placed in the deck house where they'll be safest. An enormous wave washes over the ship, dislodges the deck house, and sweeps it out to sea with everyone in it. And so Rebecca and Amy are lost at sea. Uh, some of the other people that are on board made it through the night. The people on shore realized there was a ship there and they did this historic uh, rescue mission. And so they saved some of the people, but some of them like uh, Rebecca and Amy were lost at sea. So this is a cenotaph. A cenotaph is a monument for someone whose body is not buried here. And uh, the inscription here says mother and daughter lost at sea. So this is the uh, Amy and Rebecca Caverly. All right, we're going to walk down this path and then take a left on the pavement.
So this is um, Louisa Maria Wells, uh, is the person buried here. And um, I, the way I understand it is somebody came in like recently and sort of like trying to be helpful to clean the stone and really kind of messed it up. So that's why some of it's dark, some of it's light. Uh, so we're still trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, it's unfortunate, but anyway, uh, it's still a beautiful piece and it's an interesting story. So Louisa Maria Wells was born in Vermont. Uh, she was the only child. Her father died when she was really young. So to care for the daughter and herself, her mother comes to Lowell and she gets a, a job as a, a kind of the, uh, she's in charge of one of the boarding houses where the mill girls live. She sort of supervises them, cooks for them, helps them clean, that sort of thing. Um, so Louisa goes to work in the mill. She works almost her entire life in the mill uh, and she's very frugal. She saves a lot of money. So when she dies, her mother predeceased her. When Louisa dies, she leaves a will. Um, she had no siblings. Um, she had some cousins. But she left her entire estate to be used to build the monument in Lowell Cemetery for her and her mother. Uh, so the lawyer who was named the executor of the estate files the probate. And the cousins who didn't have much to do with her in her life all of a sudden decide that her money could be better spent on their worldly needs than on a monument, so they file a contest of the will in probate court. And it drags on forever, 10 years, 12 years, whatever. Finally, they rule in favor of the monument. Now, kind of the silver lining to that story is that the delay caused the money to really ex rise in value. So there was a substantial sum money, I think it was like $15,000, uh, which was a lot back then. So the lawyer's name was Daniel Richardson. He wrote a letter to his cousin who happened to be a sculptor asking if he would carve a monument. The sculptor's name was Daniel Chester French. Now he's the one that carved the Minuteman at Old North Bridge and Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. Mm -hmm. He writes back saying, I'm kind of busy, um, <laughs> but I have a really talented associate who I think would do a great job. And that talented associate was a woman named Evelyn Longman. Uh, Evelyn had been born in Chicago. She went to the Art Institute of Chicago and she became kind of a, an apprentice to Daniel Chester French. She was very talented. Um, but she had a hard time getting jobs on her own because who would hire a woman after all, right? Uh, her breakthrough occurred when the United States Naval Academy decided to build a new chapel and they created a blind competition to create the bronze doors at the entrance to this chapel. Now, I had the good fortune to, to visit the place not too long ago and the doors are at least 15 feet high, they're massive, and they have this kind of um, artwork on them to tell the history of the United States Navy. Well, she won the contest, she won the blind contest. Now, of course, when the judges realized that the winner was a woman, they tried to weasel out of it, but they weren't able to. She built it, it's beautiful, and if you go visit down in the corner, it says Evelyn Long. So that's her big breakthrough. She made this, she calls this figure the angel of death. Now, if at the beginning of the tour I told you we're going to see the angel of death, you would have had visions of some like Halloween type nightmare scenario, where quite the contrary, the look on this uh, figure's face is very peaceful, comforting. Um, the, the seated figure is dressed in a simple smock dress that a lot of the mill workers wore. And the look on her face just is fatigue, tired, exhaustion. And the angel is, and you can tell she's a mill worker because she has the bobbin with the yarn unspooling over her lap. And the cutoff of the yarn symbolizes the cutoff of life. And the angel's about to touch her on the shoulder. And I think the, the message is, 
you know, death is not something to be feared. It's a release from the, the, all the trials of your life. And so that's the uh, Louisa Wells Monument by Evelyn Long. All right. Up the hill. Uh, so this is a uh, grave of a, uh, among others, buried here. It's a, a U.S. Army veteran who died in the Spanish-American War. Uh, that's one of these forgotten wars that, that doesn't get much attention because it, it was very quick. Um, but there was uh, quite a bit of involvement uh, from people in Lowell. There were two companies. A company was about 100 soldiers from Lowell that were uh, mobilized from the National Guard, were sent one to Cuba, one to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Walter Tilton was in one of the companies that went to Cuba. Uh, he was only uh, 19 years old. Uh, he served, they didn't see, they only saw a little bit of, of fighting. Uh, but on the ship back, uh, he was, had a disease and he died from it at sea. Uh, a tremendous number of the casualties during the Spanish-American War were from disease and illness um, among the American army. Uh, and as historians say that that really taught the leaders a lesson about the importance of uh, good hygiene. And so uh, 10, 15 years later, when the U.S. Army rose to be several million men for World War I, uh, they were much more diligent about like field sanitation and medical care and stuff like that. And so the number of deaths from disease was a lot less percentage-wise until the Spanish flu hit, but they knew nothing about that. I believe, and the, the other people buried here are named Duncan. And I'm, I'm quite sure it's, it's uh, the family of George Duncan, the founder of the Enterprise Bank. And so I think there's some relation uh, between him and Mr. Tilton. Uh, next one is just right over the other side of this road. You can see this sort of uh, curbstone thing that's St. St. Paul's Church. So what would happen is uh, uh, sometimes a church or an organization would buy one of those 30 grave lots uh, and they would use it for charitable uh, cases. And the person I want to talk about is buried right here. Um, and her name is Barilla Taylor. Barilla came to Lowell when she was only 14 years old uh, to work in the mills, and she died when she was 17. And the cause of death was brown lung. Um, and the mills, you know, the working conditions were terrible. Uh, there was all this cotton dust, and they kept the humidity very high because if it was dry, the threads would break. And so it, it was just very difficult working conditions. Uh, and so uh, Barilla died, uh, was a, one, among one of the many young women who died um, working in the mills. Now I will say this about the, the mills, that uh, as difficult as the conditions were, uh, in one respect they were very empowering for young women. Because it wasn't like they had easy lives living on a farm. Um, they had to work equally long hours, equally hard, but they didn't get paid anything for it. Uh, but here, they were on their own, they were able to get paid um, for their labor. Uh, and not only did they work 12 hours a day, but then they'd go out at night and write books, and play music, um, and enjoy being in the city. And I think most of them, once they accumulated some money, they would go back to the farm, and they would have money of their own. Uh, but as difficult as it was, it really was a great opportunity for them uh, to, to sort of uh, have some independence. Uh, one more stop.
So this is Paul Sangas, a, a name I'm sure is familiar to a lot of you. He was born here in Lowell in 1941. Uh, his father ran a cleaning business. Uh, they they lived uh, at the corner of Highland and uh, and uh, Thorndike Street, right across from the Keith Academy building. Uh, Paul went to Lowell High School, uh, then he went to Dartmouth College. Uh, he went into the Peace Corps, he went to Yale Law School, and in 1969 he was elected to the Lowell City Council. He served two terms on the council, and he got elected as a Middlesex County Commissioner. He was there for two years, and then he got elected to the United States Congress. He was there for, I think, four years, and then he became a United States Senator. He got elected in 1978 to the U.S. Senate to a six-year term. 1984, People thought he was going to announce his re-election. He instead announced he wasn't going to run because he'd been diagnosed with cancer. And he wanted to spend more time with his three young daughters and his wife, Nikki. Um, he came back to Lowell, and while he did become very active in like corporate boards and things like that, and he wrote several books, he really plunged back into Lowell. Uh, people said he became the 10th Lowell City Councilor. And so a lot of the the real renaissance of Lowell uh, in the 1990s, I think. Um, you know, there are many people that, that played a part in it, but he was definitely a driving force of it. Um, the cancer uh, uh, went into remission. 1992, he ran for the United States presidency uh, in the Democratic primary, uh, which was won by Bill Clinton, who went on to become uh, elected to two terms as president. Paul came back here, 1996, the cancer re came back, 1997, he died um, at age 50, uh, 56, very young. Um, and his wife, Nikki, then uh, was elected to Congress years later. Uh, so actually, and she's still alive, uh, but uh, there are two husband-wife couples who served in Congress. Um, Paul Songus and Nikki and Edith North Rogers and her husband John Jacob Rogers. Um, so this is the Songus um, grave. You can see that uh, a number of his family members are here. I always remember when he was running for county commissioner, uh, he he did like a publicity stunt where he canoed on the Concord River from North Bridge up here to Lowell, um, and it, it was to illustrate his. Uh, the importance of the environment. And, and so I think it's particularly appropriate that, you know, his grave is sitting here at this beautiful spot overlooking the Concord River. All right, I lied to you. We got one more stop that's just up ahead here. <laughs> So that was actually the last story I was going to tell you. Uh, I just wanted to wrap up here. Uh, just looking ahead to coming uh, coming attractions. Uh, I do this same tour again tomorrow morning. Uh, it'll be the same uh, same people uh, that I talk about. But if uh, you encounter somebody this afternoon and says, oh, I wish I knew about it, uh, you tell them, oh, I'll be here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I'm going to do another tour on Saturday, May 18th. It's the Saturday before Memorial Day weekend. The cemetery had long done um, an event for veterans on Memorial Day, around Memorial Day, um, where it consisted of a parade and a speaking program, but COVID sort of disrupted that. Uh, and so instead we've done, uh, we've replaced it with tours that uh, highlight the stories of some of the veterans buried here. And it's not just what they did in the war, um, it's, it, it's that they, we're in the military, but then they did other things. So that's May 18th at 10 o'clock. That starts up at the other gate. The following Saturday, which is the 25th, May 25th, which is the uh, Saturday of Memorial Day weekend, I'm doing a uh, Lowell walk for the Lowell National Historic Park um, of the Hamilton Canal District. And so that starts at the National Park Visitor Center headquarters uh, in downtown Lowell. 
Um, I mostly just wanted to thank you all for coming. I, the head count was 50 people and three dogs, which is really extraordinary given the weather conditions um, this morning. Um, but thank you all for coming. I'll hang around. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, just come on over. But the rest of you can go uh, head off and grab lunch. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.